If any of your children or grandchildren were gay, would that change your perspective? Would you then think it were unacceptable for, for consenting adults to be criminalized in this way? I, I think that it's a law which is there. If I remove it, I will not remove the problem. I struggled to make this one. Not because I don't know where I stand on one of Singapore's most controversial laws, but because where I stand is painfully obvious. What could be said that so many rational Singaporeans have already said about the black stain on our penal code that unabashedly discriminates against people who don't conform to traditional notions of sexuality? What can an unenlightened non-believer like me say to change the minds of people who believe that they are acting on behalf of an all-knowing, all-powerful being that created everything in existence? Nothing. The answer is nothing. But that's okay, right? Because in circular Singapore, every law exists to maintain an equitable society, not to please any ethereal entities. The Founding Fathers of the United States deliberately made no mention of God when they wrote the US Constitution in 1787 because history had revealed to them the unjustifiable volume of blood spilled through faith-based wars. They knew it'd be disastrous to force their diverse citizenry to conform to legislation based on the divine rules of one religion. It's in everyone's best interest when lawmaking is a nuanced, circular affair. This allows laws to be updated alongside people's shifting values and advancing technology. We learn society works better when we rehabilitate thieves rather than cut off their hands. We learn creativity is a productive force when we protect it the same way we protect tangible goods. We learned we shouldn't lock anyone in a cage just for saying something we don't agree with. Oh, wait. Not only are religions ill-equipped to handle malfeasance in modern times, their morality is rooted in stories that were first passed down verbally for generations and then inscribed in forgotten languages before being selectively translated several more times until culminating in their final iterations we have come to know today. Comedian Ricky Gervais said it best. If you took every holy book, every holy book there's ever been, every religious book, every bits of spirituality, and hid them or destroyed them, okay? They, they went away and never, right? And then you took every science book and destroyed that. In a thousand years' time, those science books would be back exactly the same because the tests would always turn out the same. Right. Those religious books would either never exist or they'd be totally different because there's no, there's no test. Although a few members of parliament have stated that they don't see homosexuality as a threat to society, none of them have openly pushed to repeal Section 377A. Instead, the refrain we've been hearing is that the LGBT community in Singapore is free to live their lives as they please and that no one has been charged for same-sex crimes. So, why then is this antiquated law still around? Especially when every developed nation has no laws criminalizing homosexual behavior. This includes our Asian neighbors, Japan, South Korea, and yes, even China. Based on public statements from various politicians, we can infer that the government will only consider removing the controversial law if that's what the majority of Singaporeans want. However, the government hasn't explicitly mentioned how it would establish this consensus. Is it just a feeling? One minister seems to reference this recent online survey to support his claim that currently, the majority of Singaporeans oppose to any change to the status quo. The survey showed that out of the 750 Singaporean citizens and permanent residents who were polled, 55% of them wanted 377A to stay. But it is disingenuous to take the highly subjective opinions of 750 and extrapolate it to the entire resident population of 4 million. It doesn't matter if the sample size reflects the nation's demographics. Only a referendum that forces every citizen to weigh in on the issue can give us a definitive answer. To be fair, based on past data, the survey suggests that Singaporeans have become more accepting towards same-sex relationships over the years, and this shift in attitude looks set to continue. If I was certain that these polls were all that was needed for politicians to repeal 377A, 
I wouldn't have made this video. It's going to take a lot more for our anti-gay law to be struck off the penal code. Take this hint from the Prime Minister's BBC interview in 2017. But why not, as a symbol of change in this country, get that off the statute book? It's a matter of society values. We inherited this from British, British Victorian attitudes. And I'm sure you do not want Singapore today to reflect British Victorian attitudes. We are not attitudes. British, we are not Victorian, but this is a society which is not that liberal on these matters. It's a law which is there. If I remove it, I will not remove the problem. Because if you look at what has happened in the West, I mean, you in Britain, you decriminalized it in the 1960s. Uh, your attitudes have changed a long way, but even now gay marriage is contentious. In America, it's very contentious. Even in France, in Paris, they've had demonstrations in the streets against gay marriage. It's very telling how PM Lee shifts his tone from casual to concern when going from 377A to gay marriage. The Catholic Archbishop of Singapore has also reiterated that he's willing to consider supporting the repeal of 377A only if the government can guarantee that it will not entertain further demands from the LGBT community. To people in power, 377A is a metaphorical dam that, if demolished, will invariably lead to more challenging discussions about what makes a fair society. Now, if you're wondering why that's a problem, that's because you're a rational human being who wants to hear voices with views different from your own so that you can form opinions that take into account the concerns of the people around you. But this isn't what the authorities want. They have us convinced that the bonds that hold Singapore's society together cannot sustain passionate public debates about deep-rooted personal beliefs because we have a whopping total of not one, not five, not eight, but three distinct ethnicities living together on one small island. This mentality has, of course, led to Singapore's long-standing culture of self-censorship. It is, however, strange that the authorities seem quite comfortable letting people verbally spar over LGBT rights, especially online. You'd think that if our social glue was as brittle as wet toilet paper, they'd want to moderate the national conversation more to prevent it from escalating into a full-blown calamity. From a political point of view, their actions make sense allow every individual to work out their feelings on the matter on their own time, while you, the policymaker, sits on the sidelines and occasionally offer generic statements that don't offend either side, thereby not affecting your standing in the next election. But a government that's slow to react to social change will result in a nation of people with wildly differing human rights views, bumping into each other constantly. Residents will feel exasperated because they'll be forced to keep their convictions to themselves to avoid offending anyone. This unspoken friction will only end up weakening social cohesion. Repealing 377A will not only avoid this bleak future, it will also send a strong reminder to everyone that legislation isn't meant to coddle your irrational beliefs. Sure, Singapore, like many nations, makes concessions for religious practices but those practices should never be an imposition to others. For example, Singapore doesn't allow the hijab or other elaborate headdresses to be worn in environments where there are safety or security concerns. In my estimation, the country's leaders also can't seem to effectively communicate the importance of secularity because many of them still believe that Singapore should continue to be informed by all conservative Chinese values. Since many of these values, such as the preservation of the traditional family unit, overlap with those of Abrahamic doctrines, why stir the pot? Not to mention that some members of parliament are devout followers of faiths that denounce LGBTs. However, as stewards of the country, MPs have significant influence over their people. They should take a proactive stand for or against controversial issues like 377A. If they don't stand their ground, it means they don't have to defend it. We don't accept leaders who don't clearly state their economic and social goals for the country. So why should we allow them to keep quiet about their religious aspirations? 
If MPs feel uncomfortable sharing their faith with their constituents, it stands to reason they feel equally uncomfortable talking to their fellow MPs about them too. So, how many MPs who haven't spoken about 377A have regressive and spiteful opinions about LGBTs? How many of them are discreetly trying to keep or introduce policies that advance their conservative religious principles? Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Religion has been enjoying too much unchecked freedom. It's only fair that the public be given leeway to scrutinize archaic doctrines, especially when they are interpreted differently by different faith leaders. By all means, practice what you want to practice in your own home or place of worship, on your own time. But the moment you think your faith has the right to tell everybody how they should live, you better make sure that conviction is backed by measurable data, not myths. It's vital for the government, which directs virtually every aspect of Singaporean life, to get rid of 377A sooner rather than later, because it's a consensus that most of the civilized world has already reached. And more importantly, it will signal to Singaporeans, who are used to being led, that it's time to move on to other more important human rights conversations. Set coffee, out.